This is Maria. And this is Hester. And together we are the Live Concert Counselors. Welcome to our live session. As you can imagine, this is a very, very exciting moment for us. First thing we want to say is thank you all for following us, for watching our videos every week, for sending us feedback. We are really happy to have gone over the 1500 subscribers. We hope you find our tips useful. We want to start the session with uh, playing something for you and we chose a Telemann duet that we actually uh, use very very often in our sessions to explain stuff and we play little fragments from it but we thought it's nice to show you uh, two complete movements <laughs> go also right away into the second part of this evening session which is some room for questions you may have for us okay we have our first question in. by natalie labert what is the best way for an adult learner to progress i think it's very important that you maybe don't stick to methods that are especially written for children but pick a nice course of pieces and start in a very easy way and then progress so that the inspiration comes also from the music that is a, at a very high level and very high quality. For example, you can pick the themes from Van Eyck and then you can expand from there. 
And in the in the meantime, you can also do some cool technique exercises, which might not be uh, so suitable for children to do. Adults, they are much more patient in, uh, in, in general. So that is really nice to make use of, to have this motivation to really go to the maximum level possible. Always stay curious for new things that you may learn, because it's easy when you are practicing, especially on your own, to get into a sort of routine, a circle that you keep repeating. And it's any idea that you get, it can be from one of our videos, one of Sarah's videos from a teacher, um, from a book, anywhere, uh, you find something new and you try it out. This is also something that helps you uh, enormously, I think, to progress. I see that we have another question from Japan. What's your suggestions for people who can't get lessons? I can only use dolmetch method in these days. By watching and by listening to good recordings and to tutorial videos and to uh, online lessons, you can learn to listen what sounds good and what you think sounds good and see if you are doing things well. Of course, having a method like the dolmetch method is useful because it orders things in a systematic way and that helps you going further. But maybe I wonder, is there anyone in your area that you may make music with? Because even if this person is not a recorder player, but for example, you find someone who can play piano or guitar for you, this may also be super helpful to find out if you are playing your rhythms correctly, if you are playing in tune and you have a very nice interaction and you will learn a lot from each other. The using the internet can also be a, a great source to get maybe online lessons privately. Um, because now we are chatting live and we also both had the experience of teaching via Skype. It's maybe not ideal but it, it's, it's very useful to get some feedback and using the internet and develop your aesthetics is a very good thing and your dolmetch method too. So thank you for the question. <laughs> From the Recorder Arcade, it's a great channel, by the way, check it out. How do you produce the best double tonguing? I grew up as a tuba player and tonguing technique is very different on recorder. Yeah, that's yes. true, I can imagine. Actually, my first teacher in Spain he was also first a tuba player and then a recorder player. So that's uh, something we have in common there. We actually made a whole tutorial or, uh, about single tongue and about double tongue. I don't know the episode numbers by heart. If I think about you being a tuba player, maybe the movements of the tongue can be a little bit too big for the recorder. When you want to increase the speed of your double tongue, it's very important to fix your tongue against the back of your teeth, mm -hmm. in, in the back of your mouth, and then, then you have a st stability of the tongue, because otherwise it sounds a bit floppy. Maybe, Maria, can you, can you show this? Like a, 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 a sloppy sound? <laughs> a sloppy oh, I'm, with, I'm very good okay. at that. because there's movement, especially of the chin or the tongue is moving too much. When you have the, the tongue fixed to the sides and the chin is rather closed, so the teeth not really together, but almost, then you can make the movement of the tongue very efficient. And what you just heard from Maria is that she, she practiced with this kind of rhythm. It's a very good one because it, it, it makes you move also and you the direction of the sound goes on like this. And then vary the pattern with maybe... And always keep your air floating because if, if you don't do that, it, it, your tongue will also get stuck. So these are some basic tips, but I for sure recommend to check out our episode about double tonguing. Whenever you feel there's too much pressure, that's also not a good thing. So if you are pressing with your tongue against the teeth or against the palate, mm -hmm. like then you get this rougher sound, then you can really. The next question is from Arvid Klaassen. He says, I have troubles to keep my right pinky close to the recorder. It always goes way up when it does not cover a hole. Any tips to solve that? It may um, be that the position of your uh, whole instrument is a little bit out of balance. If you, for example, are holding the instrument too low, then you will have to uh, hold it a bit. And that probably means that when, you, uh, when your right hand is free, it goes into strange positions. We always recommend to first have a good balance with the thumb and your lips, then make sure the fingers are aligned on top of the finger holes, 
then you cover them and you make sure they can move up and down and that no matter how far they go, they can go back. And then uh, it's a good idea to maybe pick a piece of music that you like and you know very well and play it very slowly and only concentrate on what that pink is doing. So imagine that you play. And all I'm thinking about is where is my pinky? Is it moving? Did it go away? When you notice that it happens, then you know, aha, my pink is moving away. No, I'm gonna gently put it back in the right place and keep playing my sonata. And so you develop a sense of when it happens and you can correct it. And if you feel that your pink is moving because other fingers are moving, because the muscle is connected, then try, really try to change your position so that the, the fingers have the possibility to, to move. And uh, uh, yeah, so that it feels more relaxed. Uh, oh yeah, we get a tip from Jane Malinson as a learner. And I found it very helpful playing with more advanced and very supportive players. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this uh, supports also our Supported tip the... before. Okay, now a question from Ivan de Miguel. My brother plays the double bass. Do you think there's any nice combination between recorder and double bass to play together? What size of recorder would fit best? Any idea? Thank you. Yes, of course, that's a great combination. I'm sure you can come up with all kinds of music to play with. I guess it depends on the music you play, which instrument will fit best, because I can imagine it's a very cool thing to have two large instruments playing together and to have sort of two basses. I can imagine you can play some jazzy or folky music in this setting and it will work very well. But on the other hand, if the bass take a bass roll and you play on a high recorder, you have this very beautiful game of opposites and that can also be really great. I'm thinking more of the modern and folk and jazz uh, sounds first rather maybe than early music, but anything is possible really. Yes, and actually I would maybe um, recommend to start also improvising a little bit to, 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 to discover the sounds and how, and, uh, to, to how it sounds uh, together. And this you can do with really easy means. It doesn't need, need to be um, elaborate or something. Just a couple of plucked notes together with your bassette recorder yeah. with this in the same pitch and then lengthening them a bit. Let's see how the colors mix and match. But yeah, it could be also very cool to do some basso continuo with a plucked plug bass and then a high instrument. It can be, it's so nice to think out of the box with these things. So I would say, go for it, go for it. And send us the result. Yes. We want to hear it and we want to see it. Absolutely. Will there ever be a joint video with Team Recorder? Ah, <laughs> well, uh, we had some collaborations uh, for sure. There's one video about uh, the sub bass uh, recorder in B-flat, the Renaissance one, where I am uh, playing that instrument. True. Sarah is leading that. And also Sarah made a video about the Royal Wind music in the Open Recorder Days Amsterdam. So these are collaborations, but a real one has to belong to the future. How do you recommend practicing when I frequently play seven sizes of recorders? That's a very good question. And we are familiar with the phenomenon that uh, at a certain point, any recorder player basically has more instruments at home that they can play daily. To go with your own intuition and with your own motivation is always a good thing to do, actually. So if you you maybe are working and have set goals on specific instruments and you work first on that, but maybe as a warm up or as a nice closure of your session, you take a completely different instrument every day, something else, whatever you feel like on that moment and improvise a bit or play one of your favorite pieces and in that way you keep the feeling uh, and the memory of that specific instrument and you also develop the um, intuition to change very quickly from one recorder to another without any problems and in a yeah. fluent way what i what i like to do sometimes is i play one piece and i practice that one piece but i practice it on as many sizes of instruments <laughs> as possible because uh, in that way, you really learn to adapt to the size of the holes, the, the size of the board, the amount of air, the, the position of the mouth with the same piece. I find it a very good uh, exercise. Yeah. Also, because in, sometimes in concerts, we really need to change from double bass to sopranino, which is always the most scary moment, I find. Your, your fingers are yeah, fixed in a, in, a, in a broad position, and then you have this tiny instrument, and 
Yes, this we need to practice at home. From Heller Elias, can you recommend some systematic exercises for improving the sound of the recorder, similar to the exercises by Moise for the boom flute? To be honest, I don't know of specific studies that are focused in sound only. I think the best thing is scales and long notes and simply focusing on sound. And we have given also some tips in concert counselors episodes about looking for the limits of your instrument and then finding a nice core in the sound, vibrato. I think you can do that with scales and with long notes, most of all, and you can do that with cantabile repertoire, so to say, with Renaissance vocal parts, for example, see if your sound is beautiful enough, if your internal tuning is beautiful enough, if you find your playing beautiful enough, because that music is technically not super demanding, so therefore you can give all your attention to sound, shape, uh, the line, and the expression of certain intervals. And if you use that kind of repertoire, exercise with the position of your tongue, your cheeks, your throat, and your lips. If you uh, put tension on them or mainly relax uh, on them, it's a huge difference. If my uh, throat is lowered, my C is like this. And if I close my jaws and I have a bit more closed throat, it sounds like this. And this kind of realization is very helpful. And this actually goes with all the parts around your airstream. Uh, they influence the sound. If you change the position there and evaluate for yourself how the sound changes and then also see if that's the best sound for you or if you like it the best and then record yourself. I did that really systematically to, to check per instrument what is the best sound. Well, good luck. Great, we're gonna take one last question. Yes. I have several recorders, alto, tenor, and soprano. I am an adult beginner. Should I stick to one to get the basic skills or is it okay to use all of them from the beginning? It's difficult to give one answer that is good for everybody, I would say. But the advantage with recorder is that, for example, soprano and tenor use the same fingerings in C and the great bass actually as well, and even the sub bass. So I think when you are starting to learn how to read, it may be, if you are a beginner, that you feel more comfortable, okay, I'll set uh, the C fingerings first, using soprano, tenor, great bass, any size. And then when you feel you're far enough, you start with all the F fingerings, and then finally you have built it all up. But some people who have uh, a quick talent for these things like to actually combine both right from the start. So when I've worked with uh, adult beginners, usually we started with uh, alto and uh, F fingerings, and sometimes they combined alto and basset. And then later, after six months to a year or so, they started playing C fingerings, and this uh, was all right. So some construction like this may work well for you as well. I think ex exactly the same. <laughs> okay, well then, we are really uh, happy about all your questions, but we want, we are very excited to move on because it's quiz time! We are so happy that you are with us tonight and every week that we have a very special prize for you. It's the second ever made travel coffee mug of the Concert Counselors. We are very happy to send this mug together with a CD of your choice by Seldom Seen Recorder Quintet, signed, signed by... by all of us, by all five of us. So you can choose between Tarasea, between the Goldberg Variations, between El Aires and Serena with Spanish music, and Delight in Music with English Renaissance music. You will have to answer four questions. We are going to read for you the questions, listen to the answers, and then make up your mind what is the right answer, A, B, C or D, so it's not the choice. I'm going to take the first question. In last week's episode about John Dowland, we spoke about the tear motive, which is a series of four descending notes. In music theory, what is the technical name for a set of four notes? A, trichord, B, pentachord, C, tetrachord, or D, harpsichord? Question two. I'm going to name four people. Please choose the only one who was not a recorder maker, as far as we know. A. Jacob Denner. B. Silvestro Ganassi. C. Thomas Stainsby Jr. And D. Peter Bresson. 
we go on with the third question, and this one has included a demonstration by Hester. What is the name of this technique? A, a flagellate tone. B, multiphonic. C, tremolo. D, flatter tongue. The last question. As far as we know, in which of the following musical forms did Johann Sebastian Bach include a signed recorder part? So, parts that are original and specifically written for the recorder. A, sweet and sonatas. B, canons and richer cars. C, sonatas and partitas. Or D, cantatas, passions and concertos. Hopefully, you have all four answers right. Put it in the chat and press enter. I'm going to put the names of people who got them right into our random prize winner generator, while Hester runs you through the correct answers. The first question, the sequence of four notes, the right answer is, this is called a tetrachord. Then the next question, we named four people, and there was only one that was not a recorder maker, as far as we know, and the right answer is Silvestro Ganassi who is famous for his books, but he was not a recorder maker, but a great player. The third question uh, was about contemporary technique, and I played a flageolet tone. I hope it was audible for everyone. The other uh, options were a multiphonic. This sounds, it sounds like this. Tremolo. And a flutter tongue. Those were the other techniques. And then the last question about Johann Sebastian Bach uh, writing specifically for the recorder. He did that in his cantatas, passions and concertos. Um, because, and then maybe the tricky one was at sonatas and partitas, but um, unfortunately they were all written for the flute or the violin. Congratulations, Here. a lot of people. A lot of people right got it answer. right, and I have entered all of your names in this list. I have here this beautiful wheel of fortune. Here we are. Okay, I'm going to spin the wheel now, and then we will find out who the winner is. And the winner is Jane. Jane Mallinson, you are the lucky one. I will make a nice package and send it to you. Yes, and for the rest of you, we are very sorry that you couldn't win tonight, but we hope that soon uh, we will reach the 2000 and we will have another good excuse to give you more presents. Um, so if you have friends and contacts who may like to join our channel, please tell them about us. We will see you on the 22nd of April again with a fresh and new episode. Thank you all for watching and joining us today. <laughs> it's nice to see that the concert counselors community is growing and growing. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank and you. See you on the 22nd of April. Yes. Bye bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs>